Angela. Yes, by the way, these um, uh, mirrors, uh, to say you're cricking your neck and you want to look at a detail, you hold the mirror up and uh, that's the idea. But if you look here, you will see right in this corner the date 1623. And over in this corner are the initials MR for Lady Mary Reed. And the uh, ceiling um, is moulded plasterwork and the allegorical figures which represent the uh, senses, the elements, the charities, and peace and plenty and war and peace. And all the figures, apart from one, are female. So Lady Mary Reed, I don't know whether she was a bit sexist, I'm not sure, <laughs> but the, um, the male figure represents war. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the centre, war. And we're not absolutely certain who the craftsman was, but we seem to think it could be somebody called Edward Stanley, because examples of his work can be seen in, in other houses. And um, what would happen, you'd have like a, a book, like a catalogue, you know how you choose wallpaper. So they would, the customers would sort of choose what wallpaper, what designs they wanted, uh, because they're, uh, uh, particularly the five senses, in Blickling Hall, there is depicted the five senses, and also in a privately owned house called Lannis in Essex, very similar to this, um, to, to the same that, that, that is here. And so they would have just picked what uh, design they wanted. They might have tweaked it a bit to their own personal preference, but it's literally chosen, you can say, from a catalog. And then the craftsman would make it, and then it was assembled here. And the overmantel, um, uh, depicting the um, scene from the Old Testament of Abraham and Isaac, dates from about the same time. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, one of Abraham and Isaac is believed to be from a painting by a Marx Gerhardt, who was around in the mid 1500s, and it shows the. Um, angel of the Lord just to, just about to stop Abraham from sacrificing his, um, his son Isaac. The little ram caught in the thicket was sacrificed instead. Now, if you look at the face of the angel, does she not remind you of someone? She who must be obeyed. <laughs> All right. Do you know her? <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Oh. She has that steely look. So no wonder Abraham, the angel did, that was like that, the blessed Margaret. But also, if you notice the inscription down below, it probably doesn't make sense to you. It's got, but it's been ingeniously sort of shortened. But it's a quotation from the passage in the Old Testament. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And if you look, you can see that T-E-L-O, they couldn't fit it in, but they've put the R-D down at the, uh, underneath. Mm. So, uh, but when the Clitheros um, were here, they had over that, they'd cover that over and put their own motto, loyal yet free. And that wasn't discovered until when they did the restoration, the original um, inscription, until they did the restoration in the 1960s. The uh, palmets uh, of the carved fruit of apples uh, later in about the 19th century. And the uh, and also out by the window, I don't know whether you can <coughs> notice it, but it's um, it's this. The, the motto long let free I think it's one of these windows. You can just about detect. Um, yes, there's a little of this there where part of the motto is actually on the stonework outside. Just look through. Can you see the little? 
just around slide three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But who brought tea to England was the Portuguese Queen, Charles II's Queen Catherine of Braganza. And that's how so she introduced tea to England. So but this is a, a yeah. I take it away. <laughs> but it was a very expensive commodity, probably not until Victorian times when it then became, you know, but it was always kept under lock and key. The piano was uh, originally, um, it dates from about 1816, and it was originally in the Old Feathers pub, uh, but when that was pulled down to make way for the Chiswick uh, fly over the roundabout, it was then found a home in Hogarth's house. And it was always said it belonged to Hogarth's wife's cousin, Mary Lewis. Mm. Um, but I don't think so. I think it is a little later. But rather interestingly, that there is a connection with Hogarth because Mary Lewis's brother, which would have been Hogarth's cousin-in-law, actually married one of the Clitheroes at Boston Manor. Mm. But I haven't found out more about that. But, uh, so there is that connection. But uh, it's found a home here at Boston house. Right, come and meet some of the clip roads now. Yes. So this this was yes, it would be done as we would just do that. This was called the light. I'm not sure if I but presumably it was but I'm not sure on what facts they uh some of the soil, which in, in formed a cavity where gradually the water was filling up. And we had a big hole here with all the cavity, with, with the water. And presumably it's been obviously drained out. So restoration work had to take place. The water was drained out. I'm not exactly sure all the details, but we have here uh, detailing the work, the restoration work that was done. Christopher, at the age of 23, married 
Baker, I think it's Mrs. Peter Baker, but she was Sir uh, James's sister. And over we have here um, King William, sorry, uh, King William the Fourth, Duke of Clarence, his Queen Adelaide, and New South Wales. The capital of New South Wales is Adelaide, named after Adelaide and the Princess Augusta, the three that came here to dine. He, um, he was one of the sons of King George III, and he was known in the family as Silly Billy, but I think he was far from silly. He wasn't a particularly sophisticated man. Um, and he and his brothers um, seemed to have, they obviously had mistresses, and he lived with Adora Jordan, Mrs. Jordan, an actress, and they had ten children. And poor Dora, between pregnancies, really kept the finances going, you know, with various roles. But then, when his, bro his brother, um, the Prince Regent, who built the Royal Pavilion, who became George IV, when his surviving daughter, the heir, died in childbirth, their mother, Queen Charlotte, said, right, you've all got to find marry suitably. So poor Dora was um, sort of say, shall we say, pensioned off and lived in exile in France where she died destitute. But the children by her, when they went, they went by the surname of Fitzclarence, um, were all very well provided for and looked after by the royal family and they married well too. He then married a more suitable uh, person which was uh, Adelaide and they did have children, but unfortunately, a lot of them were either stillborn or just lived a few hours. 
but she was very gracious she she also helped you know took in as part of the court household the Fitzclarence children and we have the king's sister princess augusta who when they came and dined here and the little nephew was presented to her she said I like that young man's countenance. He's very much a clithero. And she spoke to him and asked him what sort of sports he liked to do. Well, I mean, he was only three and a half, but still, um, he must have been quite a mature boy. And she then proceeded to tell him that she liked to, um, that she and her brothers would play um, hockey, football, and cricket. And she was particularly good at cricket. So there we have, this is, these are on loan, I think, from the National Portrait Gallery. And in the next room, it's just, oh, and you see the beautiful ceiling, which uh, was just with, with just one figure, and that is space, which uh, is, um, signifies hope. And can I point 